All right. Good morning. This is Jennifer. This is the Dwelling Richly Bible Study. And whether you're listening on the podcast, Facebook Live, or YouTube, wherever you're from, <laughs> whatever you're doing right now, I'm glad you're here. We are going through Hebrews. And so you can grab your lesson. If you don't already have it, you can download it from the church website, lamaradachurch.com. And we're digging into a book in the Bible called Hebrews. Pretty good stuff. <laughs> and uh, this is day, what are we on? Day four of lesson five, Hebrews chapter five. Grab your lesson. I'm going to get that called up on the screen here in just a quick second. Hold on. Get that back to the beginning of my lesson so you guys can see that. And how are you guys doing this morning? Hopefully well. Let me go ahead and get the lesson called up. <clears throat> Click all the right buttons here. Share screen. Ta -da. There we go. Awesome. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and pray and we'll get started. Heavenly Father, you are awesome, amazing, good to us, loving, kind, all the above and more. Thank you right now for our time and your word, a chance to be focused, to open up our, our day or close our day, wherever we are right now in, in your word. Um, we thank you for your love for us and I ask that you would bless our time right now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So let's go ahead and get started. Again, this is day uh, four of lesson five, and we've been digging into this concept of the high priest and what a high priest does, and this is a system that's foreign to most of us, I would think, and so it's important before we move on to the rest of the book of Hebrews to really understand this, because otherwise we're not going to really have an appreciation for um, all that is to come. And we're going to be reading a lot about this priestly role in the next few chapters. And so it's important for us to really lay the groundwork, which is what we've been doing. Before we do that, though, let's go ahead and practice our Bible verse. I called it up and put it on the screen for you. You can see it right there. Um, this is from Hebrews 4. And remember, we've been talking about how um, when the book was originally written, didn't have chapter numbers. So 4 and 5 and 6, all that doesn't really matter. It's just a flow of thought and inspiration. And so we're... Um, in Hebrews 4, 15 through 16 for our scripture memory verse, but really it's just a passage that leads us right into what we've been going through anyway. And so let's go ahead and practice writing that. I put that up on the screen for you. Let me go ahead and read it for you, and then uh, we'll write it. So the verse is, we do, not, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with their weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Well, that's our verse. I've got my um, paper to write that all out. So let's go ahead and practice that together because we're working on memorizing that, right? So here we go. For we do not have a high priest. For we do not have a high priest. And what kind of high priest don't we have? So we should be thinking about that in our brain as we're writing that. We don't have, what kind of high priest don't we have? Well, we don't have a high priest who is unable to what? Sympathize. Yeah. To sympathize. I know I really have a morning voice this morning, don't I? I was coughing this morning, so my throat's a little scratchy too. I know you were thinking it. I'll get some more water going. <laughs> we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. With our weaknesses. I always, it feels like the S is gone forever at the end of that word, weaknesses. But who in every respect has been tempted as we are? But who, man, I'm not going to win any penmanship awards on this one. But who in every respect has been, write that down. I know some of you are just listening and you're not writing. You need to write this down so you can memorize it, <laughs> so you can have it at the top of your page. Um, attempted as we are, but what was unique about Jesus? Yet without sin, good job. Yet without sin. So let us then, so God went before us, we have Jesus, sinless. So the, what that leaves us with is this ability to come with confidence now. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. With confidence. Draw near 
to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. How are you guys doing on that? Getting it memorized? I'm pretty close. I think I, I feel like I've been doing better this week than I was in weeks prior to this. So <laughs> hopefully you are as well. All right. <clears throat> so as always, we, when we get into the scripture, we want to make sure that we have a full grasp um, of where we've been, what we're doing, where we're going and all that. And so we want to make sure that we are um, reading through the passage. And I, just a quick reminder for those of you who have not yet read through the whole book of Hebrews, that you really want to do that. It's going to, I promise you, it's going to make a huge difference for your understanding of God's word if you actually read it in context. Um, I know for me, I was used to and just having a small little devotional, which, which had like a daily little verse and then somebody else's long comments about it. And then maybe a quick little application. It would take up a page. And um, although there, were, there was nothing inherently wrong, it wasn't like it was full of heresy and bad teaching. It never gave me the opportunity to really be in God's word. And I honestly had the general sense that reading the Bible was beyond what I, I felt like I could do or it would be boring or I'd read it and wouldn't understand it, or I'd read it and it wouldn't give me a nugget for the day. Um, and then I, uh, there was a course, a, a, a shifting that took place. I'm not exactly sure what was the pinpoint reason why I switched that, but I, I started switching that focus and that desire off of reading devotionals to just really trusting that I could read the word and everything changed from that point forward. Now, <clears throat> I read the word more and devotionals only every now and then. And here's why. It's not because devotionals are inherently bad again. It's because I, I like the word. I, I like reading just the word and hearing God talk to me. And so I've gotten into the habit now of when I'm in the word, um, when I, when I want that connection rather than going to a devotional or a quick boost, I read actually the word of God and it's made a huge difference for me. So hopefully that's where you're getting to. I, I, I recommend it. I highly encourage her. I wouldn't be teaching the Bible study this way. Um, Bible studies I've done in the past have been, again, like I said, set up more like a devotional where I get a small scripture and then a lot of thoughts and commentary from um, the, the author. And again, it's not that those are wrong or heresy or bad teaching. It's just that I wasn't really developing a thirst for God's word. And as I would read scripture and I would say, meditate on God's word day and night, delight yourself in God's word, um, make time and priority for God's word. I was convicted that I never read in the Bible, but make a time and a priority for a devotional, meditate on somebody else's thoughts. It was always the focus was on God's word. So that, that made a huge shift for me. And that's why I, I write the Bible study the way I do to really help us to be in the word. So there's my um, little reminder and, and encouragement for all of us today to truly be in God's word. So we're going to do that. And every time we come to the word, we, we read it together. So let's do that again today. Hebrews chapter five. You should be seeing that on the screen. Hopefully that is up for you. There's this delay on Facebook and um, I can't always be 100% sure that you're seeing what I'm seeing, but I clicked back and you are now. So let's do it. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and way wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said, you are my son, today I've begotten you. And as he said in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. About this we have much to say, and it is hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. 
For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. So let's go back and take a look at our, our Think and Engage portion and dig into some of the ways that we're going to help us get into the word. And again, those of you who are on the podcast, I, I, I know you're not seeing this in front of you in terms of us, but hopefully you have the lesson in front of you. Um, and if you don't, you can either join us on the Facebook Live or the Facebook recording at LMCC Women, or you can join us on YouTube. Uh, I do the videos and put them up on YouTube as well. And that's on my YouTube channel. Just search Jennifer Richmond or Dwelling Richley. It should come up pretty easily for you. So in Hebrews 5, 1 through 4, the author of he Hebrews reviews the reason, requirements, and role of a high priest. We met Aaron, the first priest from the tribe of Levi appointed by God, and we saw the merciful heart of God to provide a way for us to draw near to him. In the next six verses, we'll see the relationship between Jesus and the order of Aaron, and we'll briefly meet Melchizedek. We talked about him a couple days ago also. So what's in a name? A lot, actually. Hebrews 4:14 4, and Hebrews 5:5 5, 5 is what we'll read next. And then note in the Bible each reference to the Son of God and write that here. So let's go ahead over to Hebrews 4:14 4, and um, switch screens for you so you can see that. Okay. Since then we have a great high priest who passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. And Hebrews 5, 5, so also Jesus did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was pointed by him who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. So what's in a name? Well, we have this reference here to who Jesus is, the son of God, and write each name there. In 4.14, we meet him and he's referred to as Jesus. Good job. And in 5.5, 5, it's the first time he's referred to as Christ. Also, good job. <laughs> so why the switch? Consider the significance of each title or name to the original reader and to us today and write your thoughts there. So what's the emphasis when, when, Jesus, when Jesus is referring, being referred to as Jesus and what's the emphasis of him being referred to as Christ? Well, it will help you if you read the it's Hebrew to me portion on the side of your screen there uh, in, your in your lesson if you're not sure how to answer that question. So let me read that with you. Jesus is the Greek transliteration of the Hebrew name Yeshua, meaning salvation. There's no J sound in the Greek or Hebrew, no J. So in Greek, the name is Yesu. Christ is the Greek translation of the Hebrew word Hamashiach, which is a title meaning anointed one. We say Jesus Christ from the Greek Yesu Christu. Um, or in Hebrew, Yeshua HaMashiach, uh, meaning Jesus the Messiah or the saving anointed one. So what it, when, when we see a switch in the Bible of, of names and how Jesus is being referred to, um, the tag of my sweater is itching me. Oh my goodness. I'm going to clip that off later. I should have clipped it off before we started. I actually hate those tags. All right, here we go. Squirrel. <laughs> Back to our study. Why the switch? Consider the significance in each title or name to the original reader and to us today. Jesus as Yeshua, um, Savior, and Jesus as Christ, which is the Messiah. So the author of, of Hebrews, remember the context, the author of Hebrews um, is speaking now of Aaron, who was anointed as a priest, and now he's speaking a, of Jesus as a priest, and so it makes sense to focus on that aspect of his name. Um, Jesus Christ, the Savior, the Anointed One. Christ is the Anointed One. So again, take a look at the context and think about it. Oh, he's been talking about Aaron being the Anointed One, now he's talking about Jesus being the anointed one. So it makes sense to change the way he's referring to Jesus. So in what two ways does the author of Hebrews compare how Aaron became high priest with Christ in 5.5? 5? So going back to Hebrews 5.5, 5, we read that he did not exalt himself and he was appointed by God. This is the exact parallel with Jesus and how Jesus is as well did not exalt himself, and was appointed by God. So why do you think this is an important point to make? Consider the meaning of the name Jesus and the title Christ. 
And don't forget that he's already asked them to, what to consider from chapter three. Um, remember this back in three one. And if you don't, uh, let me go ahead and look look that up and read that for you. Put that up on the screen here for you. Um, chapter three, verse one. Those I know some of you are just now joining the study, and so. Um, you might not be familiar with that, but if you'll turn in your Bibles, you'll see where he encourages them to consider Jesus. Listen to what he says. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and what? High priest of our confession. Did I switch the screen over? Hold on. I don't think I did. There you go. Now you can see the scriptures on your screen. So consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. So <clears throat> back here, again, we want to be in the, in the mind of the author. Think like the, the recipients of this letter and not like living in, you know, here we are in modern California, <laughs> 2,000 or so years later. Important for us to understand who he's writing to and what they would have been thinking, right? So considering the name Jesus and the title Christ, why do you think this is an important title to make? He is emphasizing that Jesus is the Savior, and he's the anointed one. So hopefully you're, you're basically keying into what I asked you to consider um, from the previous question, which was basically to write down that exact answer and what two ways that the author compare, how Aaron became a high priest with Christ, that he was anointed, which is literally what his name means. Okay? All right. So read John eight fifty four. What did Jesus say about himself? How does this relate to the author of Hebrews and the point that the author of Hebrews makes? So if we go over to John 8, 54, this is also another thing I, I hope you're learning as we're going through this study to let God's word interpret God's word. And you're like, well, how did you even know about all that? How did you even remember that scripture? How did you even find that scripture? Two things that help me when I'm reading God's word. Number one, I read God's word a lot. So it rattles around in my mind. So when, re when I'm reading one passage, let's say from Hebrews, I'm thinking, oh, that reminds me of this other passage that I read. And I remember, wow, you know what? That's a truth that Jesus spoke. And now we're seeing it fulfilled here. You see, Scripture interprets it, Scripture for itself. Um, I, I hear from a lot of people, and this is a conflict that I have in my own heart as well. Like, I don't know if I can really understand God's word. It's hard. Um, there, it's confusing sometimes. And while that is true to some degree, we have to remember that God has not given us a spirit of fear, the Bible says, um, but of, of power and love and of, of sound thinking, of a clear thinking mind. And so if I'm coming to scripture and I'm feeling fearful and I'm worried that I don't understand it, that's not a spirit from God. Um, I'm going to tell you right now that you have an enemy that wants you to remain confused about the truth of God's word. And so if he can convince you that God's word is difficult to understand, it's confusing, or you're never going to get it, then you're going to constantly be thinking about that and you're going to put God's word aside and you're going to leave the teaching or understanding of God's word to the paid professional in a sense. But I, I really want to come before you today and encourage you that you can get into God's word and understand it on your own. That's why we open with prayer and we say, God, I want to be humble before you so that I can understand this. And I, I trust you that you're going to help me see the word, number one. Number two, you're going to be in the word. You're not going to gain a better understanding of the word by doing devotionals. Again, that's why I mentioned the devotional thing before. Um, because a devotional doesn't teach the whole counsel of God's word. A devotional is more like popping a pain pill. It's like, I, I, I'd like to get out of my circumstance today, in my mind at least, oh, what's a quick fix that I can use to make it through the day? And so we go to little devotionals that help us. Because uh, we, if we continue to do that, we'll never see the whole counsel of God's word. So all that to say, um, someone asked me before, like, how do you even, you know, read this one scripture and remember this other one to help? I said, well, Number one, I've prayed and I asked God, so God prompts that in my mind. I know he does. It's not for me. I'm not that smart. And number two, I am reading the word all the time, all the time. And I'm reading the whole counsel of God's word. And so when I, when I read one scripture, it helps me remember it from another. So this is why this verse comes up into my mind. Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my father who glorifies me of whom you say. I'm oh, sorry, I popped over the screen too soon, of whom you say he is our God. This is his conversation he's having with the Pharisees and they're getting on his case about stuff. And he's like, no, no, no. If I glorify my, myself, that's nothing. It's my father who glorifies me of whom you say 
he's our God. So in other words, you're, you're talking about God as your God. We're, I am too. And no, I am not taking the glory for myself. And this is again, in line with what a high priest needed to do. They could not take the glory for themselves. So what did Jesus say about himself? How does this relate to the author of Hebrews point about Jesus? Well, that um, he says he doesn't glorify himself. And that's exactly what the scripture had said earlier in chapter five that he has to be appointed by God. He does not take the honor on himself. So again, we need to affirm and continue to see that Jesus kept all of God's law, all of God's word. And he was honorable and he did not exalt himself. And so he fulfilled the requirement. And we've been talking about that, the reason, the role, and the requirement of a priest, Jesus fulfilled that even in this moment of his state, that he was never taking the glory onto himself. So here's a note-taking tip for you. The author revisits the psalm he had quoted from earlier in chapter one. Have you highlighted that in your Bible yet? I know you want to. <laughs> Highlight Hebrews 1, 5, 5, 5, and Psalm 2. While you're at it, highlight Psalm 110, verse 4 also. And we'll get to that next. So this is a really simple and helpful thing to do as you're reading scripture to highlight things and go back to the, where they're originally mentioned in the Bible. And then you'll start to see them better. Uh, along those lines, another tip is don't use an, an e-Bible. Um, I, I love using my online Bible for, for um, quick reference or if I'm traveling, it's nice to have. But don't use your, your online Bible when you are doing your Bible study. Please use an, your actual Bible. Bible. <laughs> Why? Because you, you want to be able to write notes in it. You, you want to be able to go back and, and visualize it. And you just cannot do that when you're doing using an online Bible. If you're concerned that you're not gaining knowledge or understanding the scripture and you're still using an online Bible, that's something to quit immediately. Get a hard copy of the Bible and actually take notes in it. So read Hebrews 5, 5 through 6. How does the author refer to Jesus in these verses? Let's go back to that um passage i left that screen so let me get that called back up again i use the online bible of course when we're doing the study together here because it's easy for me to put it on the screen for you and easy for me to keep my head up and and read it to you as well so um five five um how does the author refer to jesus in these verses twice in verse five and once in verse six let me read that for you um, uh, so also Christ did not exalt himself to be made high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says in the other place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So in 5.5, 5, he refers to Jesus as Christ and son. And then in 5.6, as priest, Christ, son, and priest. So let's go back to our study here. Um, Hebrews 5, 6 is the first mention of this mysterious Melchizedek um, in the New Testament. His name literally means my king is right from the Hebrew Malki Tzedek. Malki Tzedek. Read Genesis 14, 17 through 20 and answer the following questions there. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. Genesis 14, 17 through 20. This is the when Melchizedek, Melki Tzedek, um, was introduced first in the Bible. Short little passage, and this is it, too. After his return from the defeat of Shed o Lamor, Shed or La Omer. I don't remember. That means something. I'll have to look that up later. But anyway, um, <laughs> after his return of the defeat of this king, who's got a very uh, difficult name to pronounce, and the kings who were with them, the king of Sodom, went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh, that is the king's valley, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the God, um, priest of God, most high. And he blessed him and said, blessed be Abraham by God, most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God, most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. I know, I want to stop and talk about that more too, but we are, we're going to get into it a little bit more. So let's go back and answer these questions now of who is Melchizedek. For starters, um, in verse um, 18 there. Um, he's the king of Salem, and he's the priest of God most high. So write that down for who he was in that verse. All right, and what did he do? Well, he brought out bread and wine, and he blessed him. Two things. 
And this is full of symbolism here that we're not even going to get into right now because we're going to spend the next few chapters talking about Melchizedek quite a bit. So I really resisted the temptation to break all this down for you. But for now, I'll just leave it at that, that he brought out bread and wine. And I want you to be thinking about the significance of that theme. And, and then he blessed him. And then who did he, whom did he bless? Uh, he blessed Abram, and whose name is going to get changed pretty soon to Abraham. And, um, and he blessed God most high. He blessed God and he blessed Abram. What was Abraham soon to be renamed Abraham response? Well, he gave him a tenth of everything, right? And this response is echoed in the law when God requires a tithe um, on crops and livestock. And that's mentioned in Leviticus 17, uh, 27, 30. So read Hebrews 5, 6. The author of Hebrews is making a comparison between the priesthoods of Aaron and Melchizedek. And Jesus is the link. How long is the priesthood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God? And whose order is his priesthood, Aaron's or Melchizedek's? So let's go back to Hebrews and read that passage again. Let me call that up on the screen so you guys can see it as well. All right. So in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 6, as he also says in another place, you are a priest how long? Forever. After the order of who? Melchizedek. There's your answers there, straight and simple. So we're going to spend a lot of quality time with Melchizedek in the upcoming lessons. Let me read to you the Hebrew. Uh, it's Hebrew to me box over here inside of your lesson. The name God Most High is from the Hebrew adjective Elyon, meaning literally most. as uh, a superlative, right? And um, it, it's from the root for go up or ascend. The noun El is Hebrew for God, with the root meaning might. Used together, El, Elyon, expresses the extreme uh, sovereignty and majesty of God and his highest preeminence. El Elyon, the name for God. And this is the first time that God is referred to as El Elyon, right here in this passage. All right. In closing, in his devotional, Morning and Evening, Charles Spurgeon said, Before we had a being in the world, we had a being in his heart. That's exactly what the author of Hebrews is getting at. Before we had a being in this world, we had a being in his heart. God had already set in motion a plan by which his son would be our high priest before we were even created. The author of Hebrews says, now in light of that, draw near to the throne of grace. God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. We were chosen before the foundation of the world. Are you realizing the power here? Not only is Jesus our Messiah, but specifically, Christ is to be a priest for us, to stand in our place. Jesus, the Son of God, the exact radiance of God's glory, is the Christ that has been appointed a high priest by God. That means um, we may be confident, you get to see me make the edits here as we go through here, that means we may be confident in God's grace and confidently draw near because we do not have a human high priest. We have the God-man. We have a divine human high priest, Jesus, the Son of God. All right. Well, that wraps up our, our time together in this study. And oh, let me switch that over. Hi. <laughs> that wraps up our time together in the study. And I hope that was helpful for you as you went through your lesson today. And go back through and make sure you're memorizing your verse. And I'll be back here with you on Monday because we do these lessons on weekdays. So I'll be back here on Monday. Maybe you'll already be ahead because maybe you have time over the weekend and to do the study on your own. But until then, thank you for checking in and saying hi and letting me know that you've been listening or watching the video, whether it's YouTube or Facebook or the podcast, either way, thanks for being here. It's really nice to spend the time with you and uh, leave a comment, ask a question, and I look forward to connecting with you in that way. When you do that, it lets me know that you've been listening and I can pray for you. I can pray for you by name. So again, God bless you. Great to have you here. I look forward to being with you on Monday at our next Bible study. Bye-bye for now.